Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the third series of the Michigan Defense Trial Council's virtual winter meeting. My name is Frederick Livingston. I will be your moderator today, and I am an attorney at Navarra Tesha and Catanachi. As many of you know, the Michigan Defense Trial Council, or MDTC, is an association of the leading lawyers in the state of Michigan, dedicated to representing individuals and corporations in civil litigation. We definitely have a very interesting session for you today. First, Attorney James Feeney will provide us with a presentation regarding jury selection, and he will explain what every lawyer needs to do and must avoid. Just a bit of background on Mr. Feeney. He is one of the nation's most prominent trial attorneys. He is licensed to practice law in Florida, Michigan, and California. He regularly tackles high profile, high stakes litigation matters as a go-to trial attorney for the world's largest companies. During the course of his nearly 50 year career, Mr. Feeney has been involved in more than 1500 cases, 70 of which ha he has tried to verdict. His experience includes trials of high stakes matters for the automotive industry, financial institutions, media companies, real estate developers, and equipment leasing and insurance companies. Mr. Feeney was the lead defense trial and appellate counsel in the notorious Jenny Jones cage, case in which he successfully argued on appeal that plaintiff's verdict of $25 million had been improperly obtained. The verdict was vacated and judgment was entered for the defendant. He is featured on the 2020 Netflix documentary series, Trial by Media, in the first episode, which focuses on his case. During its opening week, Trial by Media was one of the five most watched shows on Netflix. After Mr. Feeney's presentation, you will hear from Edward Perdue of the Perdue Law Group, who has, a very, who has another very interesting presentation that will explain the principles of war and how these strategies can help you win at trial and in other litigation campaigns. I will give you more about his background before he begins, but just a couple housekeeping matters. If you have any questions of the presenters, please place them in the Q&A box. We will be sure to save time for questions at the end of each presentation. In addition, in the chat box, you will find a link to view the first two sessions of the winter meeting in case you missed it. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Feeney to begin with the day's first presentation. Thank you, Fred. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, when I was asked to do this uh, many months ago, uh, I envisioned a much different uh, situation, a fairly informal give and take and exchange and a conversation. Um, I didn't think I'd have to prepare a PowerPoint. So I can tell you that one thing that hasn't changed is I haven't prepared a PowerPoint. Um, my idea of this presentation is to tell you what uh, I think jury selection is all about. Uh, I don't profess to be uh, an inventor of these concepts. Uh, in fact, I suspect that by this point uh, in our lives, nothing about jury selection exists that hasn't been written upon, spoken about, and in presentations like this. But I am gonna give you my perspective on what's important and what's not important to me. And they gave me 35 minutes to do this, so I'm going to just get right into it. Uh, first thing I wanna talk about is preparation for jury selection. Um, a topic that may not occur to you, because after all, what is the best preparation but trying cases? And unfortunately in today's world, I don't think we get I know for a fact that the lawyers in my firm do not get the same opportunities I got as an early, as a young lawyer in uh, trying cases uh, early. So how do you practice for jury selection? Uh, and the answer is uh, very simple. You mimic it as best you can. This is a situation where you are called upon to interview somebody that you do not know in front of 40 or 50 or 60, maybe 100 strangers that you do not know in a setting where most of these people have never been. Uh, there's an austere judge sitting on a bench in robes, and there are a lot of other people sitting around seemingly whispering every time any juror has anything to say. Suffice to say, it's a very, very uncomfortable setting for you if you haven't done it very much, and certainly for the jurors. So my suggestion to you is you practice. You find people to interview in front of other people that you don't know 
or that you don't know very well, you can do this in your office, you can do this with friends or acquaintances of friends, but practice. Uh, because this, after all, has to become a comfortable interview where you make the juror, prospective juror, feel comfortable. And the more you can do that, the more opportunity you're going to have to ultimately not only make a connection with that jury, but most, juror, most importantly, you're going to find a way to uh, establish and uh, learn what their attitudes are about what matters in your case. And by doing that, you're going to find a way to determine who should or should not be challenged for cause. And I should probably tell you at the outset of this that my fundamental goal in selecting a jury above all else is to find jurors that are likely to have attitudes and predispositions that will not favor my side of the case. Uh, in short, I'm looking for ways to identify those jurors whom I can legitimately challenge for cause based on bias and exclude them from uh, the, the panel. That's the goal. In addition to practice, uh, you need to take some time to learn the community in which you're picking the jury. Uh, regardless of whether it's the county next to you or the next state or 2,000 miles away, uh, in my case, I start getting local news uh, probably a month before a trial. I go online, I get newspapers. Uh, when I'm in the community, I hang out in the community. I try to find out what's important in the community at that particular time. I try to educate myself as much as I can about what is going on in that community at the time that I'm picking a jury because this is what the people on that panel have been exposed to. This is what's on their minds. This is what matters to them. And you need to have that embedded in your brain uh, for the period of time in which you're selecting the jury and trying the case. So you need to find ways to get that research done. Uh, you also need to find out what you can find out about jurors uh, before the process begins. Certainly states and counties within states vary tremendously with respect to this information. Whether political registration is available, whether questionnaires are available that can be obtained, uh, what information can be obtained uh, from the court uh, uh, about the veneer and how much in advance you can get this. These are all important considerations that your team obviously needs to have full access to. Uh, you need to understand what the relevant case law is on the issue of bias. Uh, you need to update this. You don't need five cases, you need one case. You need the best case, the leading case, on what bias is and what does not overcome an expression of bias during the course of the interview process. Is it enough on rehabilitation in your jurisdiction for a lawyer to ask the witness after they've expressed bias, can you put that aside and be fair and impartial? In many jurisdictions, uh, that is not sufficient. An affirmative answer to that question does not answer the fundamental question of whether in the prior answers the jury has expressed an attitude of bias. You need to know that case law, you need to know the statute, you need to know the relevant court rules. All of this happens uh, uh, in a blink of an eye, on the fly. You don't have time to prepare uh, in the middle of all of this. You have to go into battle prepared, and that's the way uh, you do it. You also need to understand how the judge that you have actually deals with more dire. Uh, in today's world, this uh, varies tremendously. It used to be in the old days, uh, there, were, there were no rules with respect to this, and both lawyers had free and fair reign to do almost whatever they wanted to, including arguing their case. And while that is still true in some parts of Texas and other places in the United States, by and large, it's not true. And it starts with the judge. Some judges are particularly uh, devoted to the idea that all their job is is to give you name, rank, and serial number. That's all they ask jurors. They don't ask any more information. They may not even ask them where they work or uh, what uh, much beyond their family lives, other than whether you're married or whether you have kids. Uh, other judges I've had experience with uh, take a very different approach. And actually, you can learn a lot of information uh, by listening closely to those word dyers. In Florida, I tried a case where the judge spent all day with the panel. 
Now, in California this year, the, the only case I've tried this year was in California in January and February. The judge spent three hours with the panel. And I tried a case in Ohio where the judge spent three days with the panel before a lawyer stood up and asked a single question. And uh, none of these states have any particular hard and fast rule uh, about this. And within Michigan, uh, my experience is that the practices vary from county to county as well. So you need to understand what that process is because that will shape how you approach things uh, in uh, when you stand up. And finally, most importantly, in terms of preparation is the question of jury, what kind of jury research project have you actually undertaken? In any serious case, uh, some type of focus group work, jury research is essential. Why? Because you want to develop a profile for uh, your jurors from unfavorable to favorable. In other words, you want to test the themes of the plaintiff, the th your themes, and you want to understand how the attitudes of jurors uh, will uh, guide them in uh, their listening to your arguments and their receptivity to your point of view or the plaintiff's point of view. Now, you can do this in person, or you could before the uh, current situation, but you will be able to do it again. You can do this in person. Uh, it's pretty expensive uh, and uh, get a lot of very, very interesting results in the form of mock trial or focus group activity. But you can also do it online these days that, uh, with online surveys and research that is far less expensive and you can test a lot of your themes and uh, attitudes by uh, hiring someone to conduct that online uh, activity. And there you can involve several hundred people at a time. So that's an option. And of course, I know some lawyers actually do these impromptu uh, uh, gatherings with friends, colleagues, staff people in the office, and they test their themes. I've never been a big fan of that myself because uh, I don't like doing it with people that I know and that know me. But I do know that that's done. And frankly, I've had friends of mine that told me that have told me that that actually is a fairly uh, uh, good way of ferreting out attitudes as they cross over with themes, good and bad facts in your case. So whatever one of those you choose, whatever one of those is within your budget, uh, you need to do it in some form. That's how you prepare for jury preparation, I mean for jury selection. This leads, whatever you do in this regard, leads to the development of, and I would recommend that you have this, is you need to have some kind of method that you're comfortable with to rate jurors. I use a scale of, I use a very inventive scale, minus minus to plus plus with a zero in the middle. Unfavorable obviously is minus minus, uh, favorable is plus plus. And uh, as I go through juror questionnaires, or if I have no questionnaires, as I listen to the answers given uh, by jurors to the judge and then later plaintiff's lawyer, I am rating, and uh, the folks I'm trying the case with are rating jurors with minus signs and zeros and plus signs. Why do I do this? Because again, this is all impromptu. When you stand up and you start asking questions of each juror, you need to have some quick simple, uh, effective way of looking quickly at your notes or remembering from your memory how that person stacked up in the thought process that you went through at assessing their uh, responses to questions that were asked. So you need to have some kind of rating system uh, that you use, however you develop it, that works for you. You've heard what, what mine is and, and it, you know, it does what what uh, what is necessary for me. Um, there are hundreds, if not thousands of books written on what is important in jury selection from an attitude standpoint. Uh, for me, it comes down to basically four general topics. One is that the uh, is attitudes with respect to large corporations, especially if I'm representing a large corporation, especially large corporations that make consumer products that interact with the consumer in one way or another. And if they make consumer products, do they make consumer products that 
potentially can cause injury as opposed to just economic harm, personal injury. Secondly, attitudes about uh, uh, personal responsibility, the degree to which uh, jurors view personal responsibility as important in their lives and importance in other lives, personal responsibility as opposed to uh, blame shifting and uh, viewing the world as viewing their own lives as, as an experience where things happen to them or are thrust upon them over which they have little or no control. Uh, the third thing that's most important to me from an attitude standpoint is attitudes of jurors with regard to the trustworthiness and reliability of government. Uh, uh, and uh, you, no matter what way, shape, or form, everybody interacts with government, whether it's state, local, or federal. Attitudes vary from institution to institution. I find from a defense point of view, uh, jurors juror attitudes about government, big government, and the reliability and trustworthiness of big government absolutely 100% spill over to how they will feel about a corporate defendant and policy making that a corporate defendant engages in. Whether it's in an employment case or product liability case, there's a direct correlation between these. So it's very important for me and selecting a jury to find out what those attitudes are with respect to big government or state and local government, even though government itself is not a party to the lawsuit. And the last thing that's important for me is to find out the role that uh, a jury plays or is believed to play in the minds of a prospective juror. In other words, how do they view jury service? Do they view jury service as an opportunity potentially to contribute to uh, 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 improving society, uh, uh, solving society's problems, uh, advancing a cause in some way, uh, uh, or do they see their role as more limited and uh, more confined to the facts and circumstances of this case? Uh, the more juries you select, the more people you'll find out there that in fact have a very, very uh, interesting attitude about jury service. It's very positive. It's very favorable. They want to be on juries and they want to be on juries because they think they can make a difference in the world and society uh, by service on a jury. Um, by and large, I do not find jurors with that sort of an attitude to be particularly uh, uh, identifying with the point of view of a corporate defendant. Uh, it's not impossible, but it's very important to know if a juror, a prospective juror, um, feels that way. So when you, when you have these sorts of, uh, fo this focus on these attitudes, what jury selection for me becomes is essentially a battle between you and your opponent in determining and ferreting out those jurors whose attitudes about these topics will likely bias them against your client and in favor of the, your, your, oppo your opposition. So you're basically framing questions to the panel and to individual jurors that revolve around things like uh, experiences with large institutions, uh, any little big scenario that you can uh, that is relevant, any underdog identifier scenario that is relevant, any jurors that's had negative experiences with any of these topics. Uh, any jurors that view social economic problems as the result of bad uh, big corporation institution policy making and decision making are jurors that you want to know uh, exist. And, and, and frankly, um, um, uh, there are other more topical uh, attitudes that, uh, that uh, uh, are relevant in today's world uh, in fact, this came up in the case I tried in California, but jurors, and this has nothing to do with the race of the juror, jurors who view uh, the problems in today's society and particularly with corporations and large government as involving issues of systemic racism. I'm not talking about the color of the juror. I'm talking about an attitude about whether and to what extent that dominates today's society. Uh, that's a very important attitude, uh, not oftentimes addressed in 
in jury selection that was it would be very helpful to know because it tells you something about the way that person looks at the world. And I'll tell you about an example of that that I had uh, in a few minutes this year, which was very interesting. So uh, let's get into the subject of uh, jury selection itself. And I want to talk to you about how I deal with uh, and try to ferret out bias with a couple of examples. Um, uh, you're in the courtroom. Uh, uh, if you haven't done this very much, uh, I would point out to you that uh, something that you may not be completely familiar with, jurors are watching you from the moment they are called up and are hanging out in the hallway or they come into the courtroom. They're watching you. They're watching everybody that you're working with. They're watching your client. They're watching the judge, everything. And it's typical, that, and you just you can see this. In fact, and sometimes it's almost palpable. You can you can feel that people are staring at you, uh, and they are. Uh, and it's normal for them to do that. So the point is, um, you need to be aware of that. You need to be appreciative of that. And you know, any any good defense lawyer would tell you never react to what's going on uh, in uh, in the courtroom, uh, uh, at least at this early stage. You really need to remain uh, passive and uh, quite uh, detached from anything that you see, but you need to be watching and taking notes, mental notes uh, for people that are not uh, uh, in plain view of the jury. They need to be taking notes. Uh, you need to see what juror reactions are to questions that are asked, um, and you need to have people watching their reactions. Um, when the judge is, is questioning jurors, a lot of times lawyers are looking at the judge and they're not looking at the uh, responses of the jurors to the questions and their attitudes that they are uh, 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 revealing, including body language. And you need to do all of that very, very carefully because it builds on what you know when you ultimately stand up. Most jurisdictions, the defense lawyer goes last in the questioning, which is a huge advantage. It's a tremendous advantage. Uh, because when you stand up, you've had the advantage of the judge asking questions and the plaintiff's lawyer asking questions, and you've sat there and you've had an opportunity to assess, uh, if not everybody in the veneer, let's say there are 100 people in the veneer, certainly the first 30 or so that have been questioned closely, uh, depending upon the practice. So you, you learn a great deal when you stand up, and when you stand up, what do you do? You need to portray the image that you're going to portray throughout the trial. If your image is, it, I mean, the way I look at it is, I need to, I want to be viewed as honest. I want to be viewed as someone, a person of integrity. I want to be viewed as someone that doesn't waste time, doesn't miss anything, knows the facts, and knows what's important in the case and what's unimportant. So that's how I try to present myself, starting with jury selection. I don't try to uh, 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 be a stand-up comic. Like every lawyer, uh, I'm sure I, I believe that I am the funniest guy in the room, but uh, not during jury selection. Uh, a clip every once in a while is fine, but uh, telling jokes, telling stories, I don't find that to be particularly helpful. And frankly, the longer it goes on, the more boring it becomes to jurors, and you start pe seeing people shift in their chairs and kind of look at the ceiling and it's just, it's not, it's not holding and capturing their attention. Uh, uh, I tell young lawyers in my office, don't be a lawyer. Uh, you need to speak in plain English. You need to, pe you need to speak to people as if you're visiting with them on your back porch. Uh, you cannot be judgmental. Uh, you must thank people for their candor. You must encourage them to be sincere and open and honest and talk to uh, you make them sort of get to the point where they really view you as the only audience that they're talking to. Um, if you're a defense lawyer doing the kind of work that I frequently do, you must, must uh, show respect and empathy for your opposition. Uh, if you don't do it early and throughout the trial, uh, it can be fatal to your position no matter how valid the merits of your claim are. If you're viewed as an insensitive, uncaring um, uh, uh, representative of corporate America and not someone that has a heart and a soul, uh, you will lose the jury uh, more often than not. And so be compassionate 
but don't be insincere and no false modesty. Uh, don't uh, uh, constantly put yourself at the uh, end of the line, so to speak. You don't need to do that. You don't need to advance your cause and uh, pat yourself on the back. But you don't need any false modesty. People see through that in a uh, in a uh, in a New York minute. Um, um, how do we get to bias? Um, the best way to do this is the following. Number one, uh, you start with general questions for the panel. Um, never start crossing, never start examining a single juror when you stand up. Always examine the panel and ask a series of general questions. One such general question could be something like, uh, and this is just, just an example, how many have ever have you ever had a bad or disappointing experience with a product you purchased? Um, if you're trying a product liability case, pretty easy question to ask, and will certainly prompt uh, a lot of affirmative responses, which will then lead to discussion uh, amongst the, the jurors. Your goal here basically is to get jurors talking to you and to each other, and you become a facilitator. You use one juror's response to bridge that to another juror and ask that juror what that juror thinks about that uh, response and do they agree. Sometimes you can ask the panel who agrees, who else agrees with juror number five. Uh, but this leads then to individual questions uh, with jurors uh, um, and that gets you into where you need to be to establish, to get to bias. So when I get up, I'm sure at this point there already have been some jurors that have probably expressed a bias in favor of the defendant in this case. And the plaintiff's lawyer is probably sitting there thinking he's very happy, he's going to have some for cause challenges when he gets his time to assert them. What I try to do is use those people, uh, question them, and reinforce for the panel what bias is and why this juror, although they favor me, should not sit on this panel. And I reach an understanding with that juror through the course of questioning that that's a bias that they cannot, we cannot accept in terms of jury selection and that this isn't the right case for them. Why am I doing that? I'm doing it because I want to set the framework and the ground rules uh, for the jurors that I want to exclude because they're biased against me. And I want to do that with a helpful and sort of friendly juror uh, so that people understand that what I want is an objective, impartial jury that favors nobody. That's a win for a defendant. If you can get, if you can seat a jury that where you've excluded uh, through cause challenges primarily, because you're going to require peremptories anyway, and you want to save the peremptories for people that you cannot exclude from cause, but you absolutely do not want a jury. Uh, you want to get rid of as many people as you can using a cause challenge. And the way I do it is to use a favorable juror who's clearly biased in my favor to, uh, uh, to set the ground rules for excluding other people and questioning other people. Um, oftentimes, in getting there, I will ask the panel, of, uh, to give me a definition of bias, and then I'll work with that definition throughout all the jury selection that occurs. Uh, somewhere, somebody in the panel is going to give you a very, very good definition that you can use and work with as to what constitutes uh, bias. I use absolutes. I ask jurors if they can 100% commit to be fair and impartial and read and not make up their minds until the end of the case, and I use 100%. And if anyone is not willing to agree that they are 100% committed to that uh, or some other absolute, I use that to ask them, well, why aren't you, why aren't you, why are you less than 100% committed? Uh, what is it about this case that makes you doubt that you are 100% committed? And uh, in doing that, you are drawing them out and you're getting them into a discussion that leads to ultimately, probably, a disclosure by them of an attitude that they have that you can then convert to a, a subsequent legal argument with the judge that would 
um, uh, 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 excuse them uh, for cause. Ask people about their attitudes concerning uh, whether it can bring out the fact that they are they may be skeptical about the motives of corporate conduct. I mentioned before about how do they feel about corporate conduct. The fact of the matter is that there are, you know, in any survey that I've ever read, uh, the the majority, but it's by no means an absolute majority, by no means 100 percent of people think that it's okay for corporations to uh, maximize profit. Uh, but there is a large percentage of people who think that, that is not okay. And if 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 economic decisions are being made in your case that are balancing uh, issues pertaining to favoring a consumer versus saving money or maximizing profit, those are people that may not look very favorably on the decisions that your client made, no matter how reasonable uh, they may sound. When they when they testify, so uh, uh, what I try to do with jurors like that when they start going down that path is I use the does my client start out a little bit behind? Uh, having the burden of proof imposed on the plaintiff for most issues is a great advantage for a defendant because if you can drive a, a juror into thinking in terms of uh, I start out behind, I would have to prove something to you uh, in order to overcome that view. These are all things that are basically shifting the burden of proof and translating to bias, which can get a juror excluded if you do it, uh, if you do it the right way. Uh, expressions of essentially a personal legal standard that they have that they will apply in a given case is a, is a path to success in, in excluding a juror for, for, um, uh, for cause. Uh, uh, this is a challenging exercise because in my experience, jurors who favor defense defendants and particularly corporations, honestly are a lot more vocal about expressing that attitude than, uh, than jurors who favor plaintiffs. Um, uh, in my experience, uh, these, the, the defense minded jurors will often either in questionnaire or answer to questions, they'll respond favorably to the fact that they think there are, there are too many runaway jury verdicts. They'll respond favorably to the fact that they think that no amount of money can possibly uh, replace a human life. They will think they will respond positively to the, to the statement that uh, personal responsibility trumps everything else. And, uh, and again, my experience is that def defense-minded jurors are much more willing to express these opinions than whatever plaintiffs uh, jurors uh, have uh, that uh, they are concerned about. So let me talk to you. Um, let me talk to you about a way in which um, uh, this played out. Uh, this whole thing played out in this trial that I had in uh, in uh, California. Uh, uh, this uh, earlier this year, uh, it was an automobile product liability case. Uh, a great-grandmother, a grandmother were killed in the accident. A seven-year-old uh, was uh, rendered an in incomplete quadriplegic in the accident. Uh, in the, uh, we had a 12-person uh, jury, um, and the makeup of the jury was one African-American male, one uh, Filipino uh, uh, male, one Filipino female, and uh, uh, one white male, and everyone else was uh, a Hispanic woman in sort of the 25 to 50 range. Uh, uh, during the course of jury selection, I mean, that was the jury we wound up with. During the course of jury selection, I successfully, uh, we successfully got uh, 11 jurors excluded for cause. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the plaintiff got five or six excluded for cause. One of the four cause challenges makes the point I'm making that I want to just go over this with you and tell you what, how that worked out. So this was a woman who was, who had a, uh, uh, an undergraduate and graduate degrees in material science and, uh, and uh, metallurgy, uh, highly educated, highly intelligent, worked for, worked in the defense industry, but in the consumer uh, products division of a, a defense uh, industry 
uh, company. In her jury selection, she claimed uh, expertise in materials processing and failure analysis. So on the surface, you'd think hmm, this could be a very interesting juror for a uh, defendant. Um, in questioning by the plaintiff, one of the questions, general questions he asked was, does everyone on the panel, uh, does anyone on the, he wrote, asked in the negative, does anyone on the panel not think that a vehicle should be made as safe as possible? No one raised their hands. Does anyone on the jury think that the vehicle, any vehicle should be made as safe as possible? Everybody raised their hands. And so when I got to her, I had some bad vibes about her. I just didn't think that she was really probably going to look at us very favorably or that she had an ad. She had a, a framework that wasn't good. So I, I asked her, do you remember if, do you remember that question about uh, uh, a vehicle that should be made as safe as possible? She said, yes. And I said, uh, you answered that question. Uh, uh, yes. And she said, yes, I did. I said, do you think there's any vehicle on the road that actually meets that product description? And she said, probably not. I said, do you think that a vehicle that is not made as safe as possible is defective? To which she said, yes. I said, so do you think the subject vehicle is defective? And she said, well, logic would say, yes, my answer to that question would be yes. Uh, this was a woman that did not want to be excluded from this jury. Uh, I said, will you be applying that point of view to your work as a juror in this case? Answer, well, unless I can 100% rule out the existence of a defect in the product, even if I can't determine what that defect is, and even if I can't determine that it, it, it couldn't have caused this accident or these injuries, uh, um, I would conclude after hearing all the evidence that the product was defective. I said, so given your personal point of view uh, and the fact that you would apply this point, personal point of view to your work in this case, do you really think you could be fair and impartial? And she looked at me and there was a pause for about 30 seconds and she said, probably not. Um, and then I used that. I said, okay, how, how, many, how many of the rest of you feel that way as juror number two? And, you know, a couple of people raised their hands. So, you know, and so she was ultimately excluded for cause, but not without a fight. Uh, and uh, my point is that uh, uh, that's an example of how you listen to a juror's answers. You use a plaintiff's lawyer's question that he was very proud of against him to wind up excluding a juror. And, um, and uh, 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 it, it, you know, it, but in a way that, you know, it didn't irritate anyone. No one was upset with you. Nobody... Nobody reacted negatively to this. They just saw me as doing my job, which I had explained to them. And, and it's a technique that uh, you, know, you can use over and over again. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very effective. It can be very effective. Uh, let me, I'd like to leave you with this. I see that it's 1241. And so I'm probably down to the last minute or two. Um, needless to say, uh, selecting a jury in 2021 is going to be an interesting exercise. I've been reading a lot of articles and surveys that have been coming out uh, on this topic because all of the other trials that I had in 2020 were all moved to 2021. So I'm hoping that I will have the opportunity in 2021 to actually go back to uh, doing uh, what I enjoy uh, doing uh, picking juries and trying trying lawsuits, and I will tell you this: uh, I have no particular answers to this. I don't have any great insight into this, but based on the studies that I've seen, what I've seen in all of the studies that have been done and publicly reported, where juror attitudes on very important topics are compared to surveys done in 2020 versus surveys done in 2019, so. Uh, that information is available and can be found on the internet. Anyway, I found a bunch of these studies, and one of the things I found is that there is a there is a decidedly uh, interesting and consistent shift in juror attitudes on the following topics. If you ask jurors the question whether they agree or disagree with the question of whether there's nothing wrong with a company trying to maximize profits. As I said earlier, I mean, one of the basic attitudes we're trying to get. There is a significant increase in the percentage of people 
that say uh, that they disagree with that question post pandemic, post COVID-19. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. If you ask jurors the question, should corporations be held to a higher standard? There is a significant increase in these surveys in the percentage of jurors uh, or people who say yes to answer that question. And if you ask jurors uh, uh, that whether uh, true or false, an important function of juries is to send messages to companies to improve their behavior, there is a significant shift in those answering that question in, in which they agree with that statement. So uh, uh, that tells me that when we get back to normal and we start picking juries in person, after everyone's been vaccinated and move on down the road, uh, will there be, what will jury veneers look like? And to what extent will uh, we encounter even more uh, stringent and firmly held beliefs that, uh, frankly, collectively are quite negative to a defendant? So uh, with that, I will uh, uh, say thank you very much for the opportunity, Fred. Thank you so much. That's a ton of very, very, very valuable information and very informative presentation. So we certainly appreciate your time. It does not look like we have any questions in the Q&A box. So we will go ahead and move on to our second presentation of the day. As mentioned earlier, Ed Perdue will be presenting next. And the title of his presentation is Channel Channeling Your Inner Napoleon applying the principles of war to your trial battles. A bit of background on Mr. Purdue. He is a practicing trial lawyer based in Grand Rapids, but with a statewide law and speaking practice. He is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame Law School, and he has practiced law since 1996. He focuses his legal practice on commercial, employment, real estate, automotive, and product liability litigation. A former municipal prosecutor, Ed has extensive first chair trial experience and acts as lead counsel on matters pending throughout the nation. Ed earned his undergraduate degree from Villanova University in 1989 and was subsequently commissioned as an officer in the United States Marine Corps. As an artillery officer, Ed deployed with an infantry company in the 2nd Battalion, 8th Marine Regiment at sea and in the no Northern Iraq during the Persian Gulf War, where he served as a forward observer and forward air controller. Ed ultimately served overseas on more than three deployments, including service in Europe, Japan, Korea, Israel, and in the Caribbean. He, he is the recipient of various military decorations, including the Navy Marine Corps Achievement Medal, a Joint Meritorious Unit Citation, and the New York State Conspicuous Service Cross. Ed is available for speaking and training engagements, and his book, The Little Green Book, A Leadership Manual for Professionals, is available through his website, purdulawgroup.com, and on amazon.com as well. Now I present to you, Mr. Ed Purdue. Good morning, everybody. I guess it's good afternoon at this point. Uh, thanks so much for that introduction, Fred. I'm, I'm pleased and uh, happy to be here with everybody. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, it's helpful when you hear somebody speaking on, on a topic that's a little unusual that you learn from them um, what their background is in that subject. And so I'm not gonna get into my legal background. I will say I started my own firm this year. You never heard of my law, law firm. It's probably because it's brand new, but I was with Dickinson Wright for uh, 24 years and just started my own shop this year. But um, on the military side, uh, it is sort of a unique background. I'll spend a little time telling you uh, about where I learned these disciplines and these concepts that we're gonna share today uh, before getting into the actual principles, because I think it's important for people to know uh, that you've 
walk the walk and just aren't talking the talk when you're talking about uh, things like like this. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And can everybody see that? Anybody? Okay. So, um, you know, I started out my uh, military education back in high school, and uh, I ran into a little trouble back on the block and ended up at this military academy on the South Shore of Long Island um, called LaSalle Military Academy. And, um, you know, for me, that was sort of my enlisted phase. And there's a book out now uh, where Admiral McMullen, I think his name is, you know, basically explains how, you know, changing the world starts with making your bed. And that certainly was true with me because, uh, it was a foundational education in things like discipline and responsibility. And so when you uh, are, are forced to make your bed in the morning and shine your shoes and, and uh, maintain a, a rifle, these are things that seem uh, unimportant, but really lay the foundation for future success as a leader. Um, I went on to get a, a Naval ROTC scholarship. I attended Villanova University, as Fred mentioned. And uh, if you were on scholarship uh, at Villanova in this program, you actually had a formal course of study, um, which was uh, called a uh, minor in naval science. And I have, I have a double major in political science and history and focused uh, that on military history. But this naval science degree also uh, was a formal education for us midshipmen on a lot of what we're gonna to discuss today, the principles of war, what's generally known as the art of war. And we studied everything from the Greek phalanx to the Roman legions, to the more modern German blitzkrieg and, and how those uh, principles and concepts can be applied to the profession that we were about to enter. When I graduated from Villanova, I was commissioned uh, as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. And what's interesting about uh, Marines is all the officers, irrespective of whether they're pilots or computer science um, officers or logisticians, we all have to attend the same school down in Quantico, which is called the basic school. And that typically involves uh, six months of alternating weeks where you alternate one week in the field, um, working on infantry tactics, and then you spend a week back in the rear studying things like um, the different supporting communities that are out there in the Marine Corps. Uh, but it, you know, when I went in, it was right around the time that the uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps had implemented a very in-depth reading program and sort of program of scholarship meant to imbue in us what it meant to, to be a warrior in modern times, but also to understand the philosophy and the science of war fighting. And that was the, the concept that, that, um, that, that, that's what it was titled and, and called at that time. And it involved a very in-depth um, book reading and uh, course of study that uh, generally involved, as I said, what we call today is the art of war. And, uh, you know, not shortly thereafter, I, I got to the fleet and, um, Immediately, uh, Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait. This was probably 1990. And then uh, after a few months, I did deploy overseas uh, by ship and uh, spent much of the war uh, at sea doing a ship interdiction mission, but then ended up going into northern Iraq. And so this is a picture of uh, uh, this infantry company's headquarters unit. The commanding officer is there in front, uh, Mike Mulholland who was a veteran of uh, the Beirut conflict. And uh, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later because uh, you can see in just one 200 man company, off in the distance, there's another hill, maybe 300 meters away. And that's an, another one of our platoons. So this one 200 man company covered, you know, a mile almost of territory because of the lethality of modern weapons. But in any event, I'm there on the right with my map and pencil that people used to kid me about. That's really my job, you know? And um, as a forward observer and a forward air controller, my job was not really to engage in firefights, but it was to 
uh, supplement and multiply the force um, lethality that we had available to us by calling in supporting fighters. And uh, I'll say one last thing about this. What was interesting about how far away we were from um, the Mediterranean was that at the time, this was the furthest that any Marine Corps unit had ever gone away from our traditional supply line uh, you know, at sea. And uh, that has since been eclipsed by the conflict in Afghanistan. But at the time, it was quite a ways away. So, you know, I would be calling in aircraft from, uh, from all over the Red Sea, from Turkey, from the Mediterranean. And uh, they had very little time on station because uh, they had flown so far to get to us to support us. And so it was quite an intricate uh, dance to get all those aircraft constantly overhead supporting us. And I, as uh, Fred mentioned, I've written a book on this and I'm not mentioning this to sell it, but if you are interested in what we discussed today or want some more in-depth information on not just the principles of war, but concepts of leadership and mission execution and planning, uh, that book is available and out there. So let's talk about two historical figures. And I mentioned these gentlemen because um, they're doing a little bit of what we're doing in the context of learning how to try cases and supplementing the tools that we already have to try cases. And, and this is a portrait of Napoleon. You know, uh, a lot of people mistake Napoleon as the, the sort of father of military strategy, the individual who invented all these military concepts and principles. But in fact, he really was uh, kind of a lonely guy as a young man he was Corsican, didn't have a lot of money. And so his friends at the French Military Academy, uh, you know, shunned him quite a bit. And he ended up spending a great deal of his time in the military library, studying the classics of uh, military history and learning what he could from the campaigns of military masters like Hannibal and uh, Alexander the Great, Charlemagne, and learning and sort of in his mind, condensing the lessons and the takeaways from their campaigns. Um, he was later very successful in his military career. He fought over 60 battles and uh, was defeated on only a few occasions. One, uh, the most famous perhaps is his final battle at Waterloo where he was um, beaten by uh, the Duke of Wellington to a certain extent who had sort of deciphered Napoleon's tendencies, but it was really at the end of his, of his physical and mental uh, reign that had been quite extraordinary. And there was a gentleman named Karl von Clausewitz who, uh, largely unknown to history, was a Prussian staff officer who had fought against Napoleon at one point, but wrote a book called On War, which uh, was one of the, uh, the books that we had to study back at Quantico. And, and what's interesting about On War is he really uh, made the first effort, him and another gentleman named Jomny, who was French, the most uh, recognized and um, well-developed effort to codify and categorize what it was that Napoleon had been doing so successfully, what theories and stratagems and, and uh, techniques he was using that had been around forever, but which Napoleon had done so well to uh, amass in his mind and, and develop the ability to utilize as the uh, appropriate situation arose. And I'll tell you one thing that dovetails with what we're gonna talk about in a minute. Von Clausewitz did say that his biggest takeaway on strategy was the following. Quote, the talent of the strategist is to identify the decisive point and to concentrate everything on it, removing forces from secondary fronts and ignoring lesser objectives, close quote. So you'll see that sentiment echoed in several of the principles that we're gonna to discuss today. All right, so let's get right into it. These are what we Americans call the principles of war. And they have, as all military things do, an acronym called Moose Moss that's supposed to help us remember that. And they are here uh, listed as mass, objective, offensive, surprise, economy of force, maneuver, unity of command, 
simplicity, and security. And we're gonna go through each of those today. I'll tell you a little bit about what those mean in the military context and then discuss how you might apply those at trial or other litigation campaigns. If anybody's interested, this photograph here is, is um, what's called the, the high water mark of uh, Pickett's Charge. So this is the spot that uh, the furthest Confederate units got during Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. And really some consider this the, the high water mark of the Confederacy. So um, it's an interesting spot. And, and if you ever have a chance to go to um, Gettysburg and take a tour, they have, they have uh, amazing tour guides that will talk a lot about leadership um, and, uh, and how it played out there on these fields, which is really sort of a fascinating and unique um, setting to learn some of those things. All right, so mass is something that involves the concentration of a decisive amount of combat power at a critical time and place. So as von Clausewitz said, this is the most critical skill for strategists, how to mass your assets at the critical point in time. And if I had to pick two or three of the most important principles, this is right at the top of the list. Because if you remember nothing else about the principles of war, it's about massing what you've got at the right time and place and not frittering it away or introducing it piecemeal it's bringing it, bringing it hard at the same time. So um, let's talk about trial. You know, I, I view the critical point in time for a trial or, or an arbitration as the day it starts. And that might be uh, the, the day you have pretrial motions. It might be, you know, uh, the actual day with, where jury selection begins or when the jury's brought in. Whatever it is that you feel is the start date, that's, that's really the critical point in time where you wanna have all your assets ready to go. And so you might say, well, what assets do we have in a trial? And I'm talking about litigation assets that include things like staffing, support attorneys, paralegals, um, you know, electronic evidence specialists, and then other things like having your demonstrative exhibits ready to go. Um, you make sure your evidence cart has been reserved and is present, uh, that all your motions in limine are filed, exhibits are filed, exhibit books are ready, subpoenas have been issued. There's a lot of work to make sure that all of that stuff is done, all that preparation, so that you feel conceptually that when you get to trial, all your weapons are there with you. Everything has been issued, everything is ready to go, and you're about to use them as tools when the appropriate moment arises. All right, another one is objective. And, and this is just a close up of that other picture I showed you earlier. Um, so militarily, what's interesting about this concept is uh, over time, strategists have moved away from the concept of geographical objectives. Um, back in the, the Napoleonic era, for example, Napoleon was very successful because he understood that defeating the enemy meant defeating their armies, not occupying a particular fort or not capturing a particular city. He knew that by defeating armies, he would ultimately uh, win the peace that encompassed all that other geographical territory. And historically, a lot of belligerents have been hampered by the idea and the linear focus on geographical objectives. You know, in the Civil War, if you look at it uh, from uh, the 10,000 foot view, you know, that the Confederacy's focus on the defense of Virginia was probably a mistake. And in World War II, the French reliance on the Maginot Line as sort of a, you know, a, a physical structure that could not be breached was a mistake. And, and so when we're talking about trial, counsel also has to avoid a linear focus by merely focusing on the obvious goals, right? I mean, merely obtaining a judgment in my favor or, or no, no cause verdict. We have to explore other opportunities. You know, we have to sit down with the client and discuss with the client what it is that they're really after. We can't assume that merely, uh, you know, 
burning through a million dollars, for example, to get a no fault uh, judge or in a commercial context, you know, burning through $2 million to get a judgment uh, of $50,000 doesn't make a lot of sense. So you've got to sit down and really talk through what the objective is with the client and see if there's other means uh, of obtaining that, um, whether it's during the trial, outside the trial, you know, to keep settlement negoti no negotiations going, uh, perhaps during a trial or in, in recesses in a trial. So those are things that just have to keep in the back of your mind. So one of the more important uh, other principles here is offensive. And as it states here, this, this slide uh, explains that the process of seizing and maintaining that offensive is the process of seizing and maintaining the initiative in a way that disrupts the enemy's ability to engage in effective operations. You know, this photograph is kind of interesting. It's from um, Operation Market Garden, which was uh, the largest airborne drop in history. And it took place in, in the Netherlands in 1944. And it was the subject of a movie called A Bridge Too Far. So it involved uh, a large airborne element from two different, uh, two or three different countries and, and then a ground element. Um, it ultimately, ultimately didn't work, but it, it, it captured the imagination because it was so bold and uh, innovative that, um, that people still write and talk about it. It was really um, a, um, an aggressive effort to, to do what we're gonna talk about a little bit later and that is maneuver uh, behind the enemy. But you know, in our uh, context, how does this apply to trial? And I had, a, I'll tell you a little story very quickly. I had a, a partner that um, you know, tried many cases in his, in his career and we were uh, getting ready to go to trial um, one day about, I don't know, I guess it's been about 15 years now, but and I was an associate. So I guess it might even be longer than that, but I was an associate or a junior partner and, and uh, you know, he came into my office and just very succinctly said, look, we're 14 days out from trial and I wanna drop a bomb on these guys every day before trial. And uh, it wasn't suggested as some improper purpose. There are bombs that need to be dropped. You know, there's motions in limine that need to go out. There's, um, there was all sorts of pretrial filings to be made and, um, and things to be doing that demonstrated and effectuated his offensive mindset. And so that's what we're talking about in the trial context. It's being aggressive and bold, using the assets that you have to stay on the offensive. Because if you had to say what, you know, in one word, what is offensive, it's tempo. And tempo, um, having, having an upbeat tempo keeps your uh, opponent off balance and your opponent reacting to what you're doing so he doesn't have the time or inclination to, uh, to do things to you that you have to react to. All right. Let's talk about surprise very quickly. So uh, this is a, a famous painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware River on the way to the Battle of Trenton. Um, it's an iconic uh, painting, but it's a great example of surprise in the military context. You know, he had done quite a bit of work uh, planting false information uh, for the Hessians, uh, timing his attack uh, on the Christmas holiday, advancing from an unexpected direction with you know, huge ice flows in the middle of this uh, river, which nobody would have expected could have been done. All these things to shape the battlefield in a way that was favorable to, to his forces and to impose strategic surprise on, on the enemy. So in trial, we can do similar things, although we're constrained to a certain extent by our ethical and moral obligations as counsel not to be underhanded. And so, you know, what I, when I'm talking about surprise, you have to color all of these comments with the understanding that we have uh, obligations under the court rules and under the canons of ethics to be, um, to be transparent where we need to be. And so there's only so much you can do with surprise, but there are some things in my view that you can do. And the first, I should mention is the old adage that by the time you get to, tr to trial, 
there's no surprises and everybody knows uh, exactly what the other side's case is going to be. I, I disagree with that. And, and I know some people really believe that that's just the way things happen. I disagree that that's a good idea. I disagree that it should be that way. And I disagree that people should settle for that. I think um, your intentions at trial, your focus of proofs, um, perhaps even you know your demonstrative exhibits or the nature of how you're going to present evidence uh, physically are all things that can be um, can be shielded from the other side if if again if there's no disclosure required and um, and might give you an advantage that you want to use their trial. So these are some some things that you can do to keep counsel opposing you off balance. And, and the first starts with maintaining the confidentiality of your own efforts. I don't know how many times you all have experienced counsel asking you, well, what are you going to do about this? Or, you know, how are you going to handle that? How are you going to respond to that? And I, I, you know, we're all human. And I think the natural human tendency when asked something like that is to answer that honestly. But as zealous advocates, we have to be careful about that and recognize that while we might know opposing counsel or, or just in general have a chummy uh, relationship with members of the bar, um, that, that may not be a good idea for us to share all of that. And, um, and so I've conditioned myself to just shut down. If anybody asks me questions like that, just say, I can't discuss it. It's not something I discuss and, and just move on. So as I mentioned, um, you can disclose all your evidence and all your witnesses and yet, you don't have to be so obvious about how you're going to present your proofs or what your focus is going to be at trial. So, I'm, look, I'm, a very simple example would be you might um, suggest through your questions at depositions or other legitimate means that your focus is going to be a statute of limitations defense. And uh, in settlement conferences, you know, it might come up that you're going to win a trial on the settlement, you know, on the statute of limitations. But most of us who, with some trial experience know that technical defenses like that don't go over that well. And so when you get to trial, you might actually be focusing on something more meritorious or more substantive. And so that's an example of where, um, you know, it might not be so obvious to opposing counsel what you're up to. And you know, keep in mind what uh, ethical advantages you can have. And I'll give you one, one other example here. Uh, and that is that there was, and I know that Christy McDonald is on, on, the, uh, on the panel or the, in, you know, in the session today. And, and Christy and I were trying a case together. Um, I don't know how many years it's been, 10 years ago in Kent County Circuit Court. And we decided to present our evidence electronically. We're entitled to do it. You don't need to disclose to the other side that you're going to be using electronic evidence. And I think these days it's very odd, you know, common to do that. But even back then, it was a little bit of a innovative move, let's say. But we had everything that we needed on the laptop, and we had an evidentiary specialist with us. And, and that's all we were going to use. Everything's on the laptop. And I had a, a trial binder and that's all we had at council table. And, you know, I didn't go out of my way to tell opposing counsel, hey, we're going to be using electronic evidence and you may want to do the same thing and, um, you know, and load all your exhibits electronically and have that ready. We just reserved the evidence cart, came in and we're ready to go. And, you know, you could see opposing counsel uh, as he strolls in with the, the dolly, which has 25 boxes of, you know, hard copy exhibits from uh, A to triple X, um, struggling with the idea that we're gonna be presenting everything very cleanly um, and uh, up on the big screen, and he's gonna be struggling to publish all the evidence in these three sets of 55 binders to the jury. So that's just a small example of that. All right, let's talk about economy of force. And so we're back in a sense to mass because if you're gonna mass your assets, you have to get them from somewhere and you have to pull them as Klauswitz said from secondary fronts and areas that 
while arguably might require some attention, are not critical at trial. Because at trial, it's been my experience, you know, the jury or the judge, if he's the fact finder, only have so much bandwidth. They can only absorb so much information. And we've really got to be critical about focusing not only what we're communicating, but focusing our assets that we have available. So this principle is the counterbalance to, to mass. If you're going to have assets available at the critical time and place, you have to draw them from non-critical areas. So what does that mean in terms of, of trial preparation and, and execution? And, you know, I think it, it, it means being very judicious and protective of the time that you as lead counsel spend um, at trial. You have to be focused on what you think is really important, what you think is going to carry the ball over the goal line at trial and not fritter away assets that you have on, on matters that are tangential or, or unlikely to move the needle at trial. Um, you know, you, for example, if, let's say you have the luxury of having an associate or, or someone else to help you, paralegal, for example. You know, if you're three days out from trial and you haven't uh, written your opening statement or your closing argument yet, you haven't done your directs or your crosses, you really should be focusing on those things and not allowing yourself to be distracted. You shouldn't be perhaps spending 12 hours that day or the next day marking up deposition transcripts. Hopefully there's somebody else that can help you with that. Or if it's just you, you've got to plan ahead so that you can do that ahead of time and not be distracted from the critical tasks that have to be done at trial. All right, let's talk about maneuver real quick. And I know I'm kind of running out of time. Um, so maneuver in general is how to uh, deploy your forces in a way that is unexpected. And, and, and really more generally it means how to, you know, maneuver means how to move your, your forces or your assets around the battlefield. But um, this maneuver, for example, um, which in French is the maneuver sur le derriere, uh, in, in English or in the American uh, vernacular is called the uh, flanking maneuver or an envelopment. This involves, um, if you can imagine, uh, a French uh, main advance guard proceeding to engage with the enemy and going ahead to, you know, head to head, start firing cannons back and forth. Meanwhile, you know, uh, and this maneuver was what Napoleon would use most effectively most often was that um, he would advance toward the enemy in, in the shape of a four point star. And whatever, whatever point of that star contacted the enemy first became the advance guard. So let's say the right hand of your cross, if you will, um, touched on the enemy first, they would wheel to the right and, um, and then gauge. And then the rest of his forces would be used to either get back around the rear or the side, which is called the flank in military terms, to attack from, from an unexpected direction. Uh, another type of maneuver is what's called the central position. And that's where, um, and, and a couple of uh, examples of that are Napoleon's first Italian campaign and then Stonewall Jackson had a famous uh, campaign in the Shenandoah Valley where he did the same thing. But it's basically, you know, concentrating your forces uh, and using them to defeat um, forces which in the aggregate are larger than yours, but which have been separated by distance such that you can focus on one half uh, or one piece of them at a time and then turn and, and deal with the other. Um, and you can see uh, in this little image, there's, there's sort of a holding unit that keeps that, um, keeps the second group occupied so they can't interfere while he would be defeating the main, um, you know, that first group that he's going after. And so, you know, how does this apply to what we're talking about at trial? And really, I think 
what it means is to, again, um, not to be so obvious about how you're going to be presenting your, your case, if it's possible. And, and a lot of this involves, uh, you know, strategy for making your um, proofs effective by not allowing the other side the time or inclination to develop ways to defeat that or counter that. And so, you know, make your points in an unexpected manner. Use permissible surprise and deception to come at, thing, at something from an unexpected direction, you know. Use new technology that may not be available to your opponent to present your proofs. These are things like, like, uh, like that, that, that we can use to be unexpected as much as possible within the constraints that we, that we have as counsel. All right, unity of command. So this is an important concept for trial teams. In the military sense, as it says here on the slide, it's been proven many times that forces that are led by one person who can effectuate a singular vision will fare better than those led by a divided command. I don't, I, I don't have time to give you a million examples, uh, but um, all right. So here, you know, one that comes to mind is is um, Eisenhower being the supreme Allied commander in Europe during World War II was a very effective um, means of coordinating the massive assets of all those allied nations and the massive egos of all their generals, such as Patton and Montgomery, to have one voice that ultimately made the decision on D-Day, for example, that we're gonna go, you know, on June 6th, irrespective of the, the weather forecast or whatever. You know, those kinds of decisions, the ability to make that singular decision is critical and effective and much more critical and effective than having multiple people involved. So the same applies really to our, to our trial campaign. It's important to have one decision maker at trial. You know, that person can ensure that your trial proofs are consistent with um, what that leader has done throughout the course of discovery. Um, you know, that the motions in limine are consistent with the trial briefs, that the, that the witnesses trial testimony are all consistent and have one theme that your lay witness testimony is consistent with your expert testimony. Um, you know, that the trial team's all focused on achieving one objective that you have articulated as the leader. And so it's not to say that you can't have an effective team, but one person should be clearly in charge and responsible for communicating the overall message to the fact line. And also for dealing with uh, opposing counsel, one voice on that. All right, simplicity. So um, there was something we used to learn at Quantico and that was, uh, you know, we'd be out in the field and these captains would be running us around and, and they'd always be pushing us to, uh, to make a decision, come up with a plan, you know, the time was critical. And at the same time, they would be stressing that it's important to keep your plans simple. And that doesn't mean obvious. Simple is not the equivalent of obvious. We want it to be unexpected, but it can't have too many moving parts. It can't be so intricate that it's difficult to execute. There's always this fog of war in the military context. And, um, and they told us many times, you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. In doing some research for the book, I actually found out that that came from Clausewitz, who, um, and that's a quote of his, that no campaign plan ever survives first contact. You have to uh, adapt and, and be flexible about modifying your plans as the situation changes and sort of plan or, or build into your plan the possibility and the likelihood that things will change and you may have to pivot in another direction. So a trial, I see this as, as things that we most know as you know avoiding terribly complex positions or arguments not throwing in the kitchen sink of defenses, you know, um, being prepared at the time of trial for the unexpected and accounting for the unexpected by doing such things as, as having support counsel ready back at the office or, or in the gallery to help as needed um, on unexpected research projects. Um, but really, you know, it also 
involves keeping things um, organized and being extremely well prepared. So when we're talking about our proofs, I like to use a very detailed proof chart, you know, where everything is sort of scripted. Um, and I try to methodically go through the game plan so that I don't have to think too much on my feet at trial with what I'm supposed to be doing. And that frees me up for dealing with unexpected events that I'm, I'm planning for and sort of freeing up my mental uh, brain power to deal with when and when they arise as, as I expect that they will. All right, so security is our last principle before we get to any questions. And uh, in many ways, this is related to surprise. You can't achieve surprise if you, up, if you don't have security. And, um, you know, a good example of this from the Napoleonic era is a cavalry screen. They would push out cavalry way out in front of, of the main body of, of Napoleon's army. And the purpose of that was just to push everything in front of them in a huge arc and deny the enemy the opportunity to see what's going on beyond that, uh, that arc and to push everything out in front of them so that there was no intelligence gained by the enemy about where and when Napoleon intended to strike. So, you know, at trial, we should also be planning for the security of our litigation strategies. And we have to, as I mentioned, have only one voice when we speak to opposing counsel. And, uh, being aware of the possibility, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for questions about what your strategy is and being prepared not to answer them. Discussing and developing a, a security plan among your trial team and being aware of social media. And so uh, one last thing I'll say about that is remember that the time for unveiling one's uh, mass attack is at the start of trial when the other side can't uh, do much about it and um, try to avoid revealing your focus so early that they can shore up their proofs or their method of presentation to counter what you want to do. So um, here's my contact info. We have a few uh, minutes for questions and I'll switch back to my uh, other screen here. Okay. Yes. Brett, any questions for us? You know, it, <clears throat> it looks like we don't have any questions at this time. I would like to mention to all the participants though, if there are any questions you think of later on, feel free to contact Ed offline. He'll answer any of those questions for you. His contact information was on the last slide. It can also be found at purdulawgroup.com. But with Great, that- thanks, no, thank you. Thank you for that valuable information. It certainly gives us a different way to think about some of the things that we see in an everyday um, experience. But thinking of them in that way certainly helps to frame and organize my thoughts. Um, and I'm sure many of you feel the same way. So with that being said, on behalf of the Michigan Defense Trial Council, thank you for joining us for the third session of the virtual winter meeting. If you all can take a moment to do so, please remember to fill out our survey regarding this event that will appear once you leave the webinar. Uh, once again, thank you and we look forward to seeing you all at our next event.